This is Brother Joe Arthur, and welcome to our live service today. I trust the music and the message will be a blessing to you and your family. I trust God will meet a need in your life as we look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Welcome to our service. It's now in progress. Come on in. We have met to worship. In the name of Jesus, I rise above the and read my title here. I know. much drop out. Let's sing that chorus again. Here we go. I know. Know that this morning. Say amen. amen. Our Heavenly Father, we invite you to come today and dwell among us in spirit and in truth. Everything said and done, glorify our wonderful Savior. Save the lost, encourage the discouraged. Revive us again. Lord, help us to see Jesus and God move in our midst. And we'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name, you may be seated. Praise the Lord. Let's make the choir welcome back. We're gonna try her again. Amen. Sing it out. Well, they sing for Jesus, your friend's about to die, yet Mary is still for a while. So they lay Lazarus in that old tomb, and then they said their last goodbyes, but come and tell the road was Jesus right on time. through life's deserts they were so hot and dry until it seemed the hope was gone that would die and then 
and I wonder where was he and is he still a friend of mine then come and tell me what was Jesus right on time just hold on my child because he's not so far away and he knows your need before you
still remember the day he saved me, the day I heard he called out my name. He said he loved me, he would never leave me, and I, I've never been the same. Praise the Lord, let's stand together, turn around and uh, wave at somebody, salute them, uh, smile. Just remain standing for prayer. Preacher Monica will come and help us out. We're going to be much in prayer today for our people that are, some are still battling the sickness and whatever and all of the stuff that's going on. Lift them up to the Lord in prayer and pray for these that need a touch from God. And how many guys a special request on your heart today? You believe the Lord's able and uh, I trust to be praying now for this uh, coming weekend. Uh, the weather looks pretty good so far for our Smoky Mountain uh, Gospel Jubilee. Uh, I told Brother Ralph and Brother C.T., we've either stepped out on faith or foolishness, one or the other, and uh, to rent that big place, and all we need is a snowstorm to wipe it off. But so far, the weatherman says, Thursday to be 55, and then Friday be 56, partly cloudy, with low humidity. How many think I'll get a job at the weatherman, amen? But pray for that meeting. We're excited about what God's doing. But you know what? Jesus may come. And this may be the last service you're in. So dive in and enjoy every minute of it. And we're gonna have a wonderful, wonderful time today. Let's go, Lord, in prayer. Preacher Bill, you pray for us. Ask his blessing. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for the choirs here today and Father, we're able to be in church, and you're with us, and we just pray now that you'd bless the service today. We think about those that are still sick. Father, we pray you put a healing hand upon them. And Father, just move in this service today and speak to our hearts, and may we leave here uh, being changed and being different. And, and Father, just thank you that you're in charge of all things, and we know that, and we praise you, and we look forward to what you're going to do today. Bless the preacher and his family. We love you. In Christ's name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Come on, Brother Shane. Make some announcements here. 
All right, we want to thank you so much for coming back. Isn't it wonderful to see the choir back? Amen. And uh, so thankful to see that and back in Sunday school. I know you enjoyed Sunday school as well. And uh, so thankful for that. If this is the first time that you're visiting with us or haven't been with us in a while, we want to thank you for coming and joining with us and being with us today. It is just a, such a blessing. I uh, hope you take a time to be able to fill out one of those visitor cards. And if you've not done that, you can do that now. So if you take a moment just to fill out that visitor card and take that card to our Welcome Center out front, we would love to be able to give you a little gift uh, for coming and being a part of service with us today. And I know that a service will be a blessing to you. If you are one of the church van drivers, we want to thank you for doing that. There is a new schedule. Amen. We do appreciate you doing that. As a, as a honest, uh, honestly, it's one of the greatest uh, things that we can do here to be able to get people to come into church. But there is a new schedule. So if you have a part of that uh, ministry, then you go ahead and be outside at the Welcome Center, that new schedule there as well. Then our new church theme, uh, Will You in 22, uh, I have so enjoyed it. But we want to spread the word all around. So we have uh, some buttons that you want to take, or if you are rather, one of the bracelets. So these are out front. Brother Landon, Sister Paige has them. Anybody that's out front will be able to help you with that. They're sitting out there in front. Make sure that you go, uh, you get one of these and, and enjoy that. And and spread that will you in 22 because we want to definitely do just that to pray to serve to give and to witness for our Lord Jesus Christ and then also 4 30 this afternoon for our choir practice make sure that you come out choir come on back be a part of that and if you would like to sign up for a rise teenagers you need to go ahead and get signed up for that as well we thank you so much for being a part of our service God bless you brother Joe you come in all right and listen big John just for you I got these bracelets, we got safety pins, and you can use it as an earring, John, when you go down out of prison, and that'll make you look real pretty, amen. <laughs> We're glad to have the choir back. We're glad to have Sunday school back, and I'm glad to have these good-looking men with their machine guns and offering plates to take up the money, praise God. And... Uh, Brother, we, we had a group here over the years called the Wisdoms. How many remember them? And the first time they came, they had a little skinny, I mean, they had a little fella playing the piano named Eric. And this is Brother Eric, and he's got his family with him today, and we love them. And uh, they go minister some today and some again tonight. But for the offertory, I want you to tear it up. And now I want to make sure it's gospel. Make sure it's gospel. And because this crowd here, they eat at Waffle House. They know all them worldly songs. But uh, y'all tear one up in a minute, and uh, it'll be great. Fellas, come right ahead. Father, I pray you bless the offering. You know the needs of the ministry. And Lord, I want to thank you, God, for the last two years in the midst of the pandemic. You have showed yourself faithful through the faithful giving of your people. Our mission program didn't shrink, it expanded. We didn't do less ministry, we did more ministry. And only you could do that. And God, you showed yourself faithful. Lord, everyone that contributes to this ministry, may the hand of the Lord and the good blessings of God be upon them. Lord, you said in your word, give and it shall be given unto you in good measure, pressed down, running over. And I pray that you do exceeding and abundantly to those who give and support God's work. Thank you, Lord, for every missionary that has already preached across the water today, and those that will preach after this service. May they get souls saved and a body of people ready for the soon coming of Jesus Christ. God, take it, multiply it, use it for your glory, and we'll thank you for what you do because we ask it in the name above every name, in the mighty name of Jesus we pray. Hallelujah. And all of God's people said amen. amen. Play one, son. Tear it up.
I could have done a lot better, but I appreciate you doing that for me. But I love this man, and we thank the Lord for him. We've been in meetings together all over the country, and several years ago, his wife and children started the ministry, and we've been trying to work it out for him to come. He's been here many times before with Wisnets, but I want you to make welcome today from Morganton, North Carolina, my friend, Brother Eric Hollis, and his family. Would you do that? They're going to sing a few minutes before the message.
songs for us and we love them and thank God uh, for their ministry. I want you to turn to the book Leviticus and uh, before Christmas we began preaching on the gospel, the message of the gospel. I'm not ashamed of the power of God, not ashamed of that gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation. And we began preaching on pictures of the gospel, how that way back in the Old Testament, before Christ was born in the manger, God laid it out in the blueprint that a Redeemer's coming, a price payer's coming, a Savior's coming, and it was pictures of the gospel. It's like the blueprint of a building. That's not the building, but this is what the building is going to look like. And the Jews had to be blinded not to recognize the man that stood before them by the name of Jesus Christ because it was laid out in the blueprints, pictures of the gospel. And we only got to one point because we got hung up right there and never did finish. And so I got the last point to that point and I got five points to that point. So by Easter, we should be through with this. But I showed you that pictures of the gospel, number one, in the blood that was shed. That's what the gospel's all about, that Christ died for our sins. And God lays it down in the blueprint. He says, get this right here. Without the blood, there is no forgiveness or remission of sins. And we begin to walk through and show you the places where blood was shed. That is a picture of the gospel. We looked at the very first place that blood was shed in the Garden of Eden when God put Adam to sleep and opened up his side and brought out his bride. And God is saying there is no relationship without the shedding of blood. Then we went to the second place where Abel offers that lamb. And God has respect to his offering. He rejects Cain's offering because it was of the cursed ground. But God accepted Abel's offering because it was a blood offering. And God is saying there is no acceptance, there is no fellowship without the shedding of blood. And then we went to the land of Egypt and as they put the blood on the doorpost, they were delivered from the judgment of God. God is laying it out in the blueprint. There is no deliverance apart from the blood of his son. It's all in the blueprint. You can't know God without the blood. You can't be accepted by God without the blood. You can't be delivered from the wrath to come without the blood. God is laying it out in the blueprint. Well, I've got a deal with the tabernacle and the temple ministry where the blood was shed and on the day of atonement, the blood was applied to the mercy seat. When you're talking about the shedding of blood in the Old Testament, you can't leave out the tabernacle ministry. Now, what does the word tabernacle mean? It means dwelling place. So therefore, if it's called the tabernacle of God, that means it was God's dwelling place. In other words, God dwelt with his earthly people, Israel, through the ministry of that tabernacle. And you can always tell if God was at home in his house before you got there because there would be a glory cloud hovering over the tabernacle. I think what I just said run over your head there just a minute. You can always tell when God was at home in his house before you ever got there because there would be that glory cloud 
that would abide. Now we know that that cloud abode on the mercy seat, on the blood sprinkled mercy seat, which is on top of the Ark of the Covenant. And that represented God's presence and God's mercy and God's forgiveness of sin. In other words, his people, people could be forgiven and dwell in the presence of God if that cloud came down. And the only way the cloud would come down was through the shedding of blood. Once again, God is laying it out in the blueprint. I can't have mercy on you without the shedding of blood. I can't forgive you of your sins without the shedding of blood. I cannot extend my pardon unto you without the shedding of blood. I can't dwell in your heart by faith without the shedding of blood. I don't know how to say it without sounding like I'm a smart lady, but God knows my heart. You can join every church in the state of Georgia. You can be baptized in every pond of water. You can have the sacraments of the Lord's Supper laid on your tongue by every preacher or every priest from Dan to Beersheba. But unless you have come to a saving knowledge, a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, through the shedding of the blood of the cross, none of that matters. How long or short your hair is doesn't matter when it comes to salvation. Whether you wear skirts, long skirts, breeches, or hypocrite breeches called culottes, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you got wire rim glasses or plastic glasses. It don't matter if you got your hair or no hair or somebody else's hair. It doesn't matter if you have a TV or you don't have a TV. It don't matter whether you believe in Santa Claus or not Santa Claus. Man, I heard a guy preaching against Santa Claus the other day and I had to go home and tell Julie he wasn't real. She cried for four days. No, the only thing that's gonna establish a relationship between you and God Almighty, you must come by the way of the shedding of blood. I'm gonna try to preach half of this this morning, half of this tonight, but if I get bogged down, I will spread it out. But I wanna lay it out in the blueprint. According to Leviticus 16, you read it when you go home. I'm too excited to read my scripture. I just wanna dive in and go to preach it. Now, I want you to throw up this diagram, if you will, of the tabernacle. This is an overall view of the tabernacle. Now, on this outside, that little box over here to your right, and by the way, I would use a laser pointer, but me and my tech guys found out this morning that a laser pointer will show up on the carpet, the ceiling, or the wall, but it fades out in that screen. So use your imagination. Right here on the right, you see that little box there. That is the brazen altar. That's where the sacrifice was made. That's where the blood was shed, and that's where you had to begin. Now go a straight line to the back part on the very left-hand side, and there's the Holy of Holies, the Ark of the Covenant, which is the presence of of God. Remember, the presence of God, the mercy of God, the forgiveness of God, the glory of God. Now, that's what we want, God's presence, God's glory, God's mercy, God's forgiveness. I want to thank anybody here today, you're glad that God dwells in you. You're glad when you was a sinner, God had mercy on you. You've been forgiven. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Man, that's what I want. I, I want the presence of God in my life. I want the mercy of God in my life. I want the forgiveness of God in my life. I want the glory of God in my life. I want to do more than have God in me. I want God on me and God through me. Right over there is where I want. But the problem is, because I'm an unclean sinner, 
I'm not even close because I was born a sinner, alienated from God. I'm not even close. So how is somebody like you and I that are sinners by birth, by nature, and by choice ever going to get in that back room with the presence of God and the mercy of God and the forgiveness of God and the glory of God. Well, the law couldn't put us there. Works can't put us there. Money can't buy us there. Works can't earn us a way in. There's got to be something that can come in your life and mine to take us away from the outside all the way to the inside. Well, let me tell you what that something is. It is called the gospel. It is called the good news of the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The only way people like you and I that are born sinners can ever have the glory of God and the mercy of God and the presence of God and the forgiveness of God, here it is, we gotta be saved. Now say that word with me, saved. We gotta be saved. Now according to Romans 1, 16, it says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, the good news of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, for it is the gospel, the power of God unto salvation. So to get from this outside to the inside, I've gotta have the power to do that to get from the outside to the presence of God and the glory of God and the mercy of God and the forgiveness of God, I've got to have the power to do that. And that power does not rest in church membership. It does not rest in religion. It does not rest in works. It rests in the power of the gospel. The death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now listen, if you will believe that, and accept that and appropriate that, it will give you the power, it will give you the right, it will give you the passage, it will give you the ability to go from the outside to the inside where you can have the presence of God and the mercy of God and the forgiveness of God and the glory of God, but only the gospel can do that that Christ died for your sin and he was buried for your sin. But on the third day he arose in power. For if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. You say, preacher, when did the power of God give me the ability to know God and to fellowship with God? and have the presence of God and the mercy of God and the forgiveness of God and the glory of God. The very millisecond you said, God, I'm a sinner. I cannot save myself, but I put my hope and my faith and my trust in the blood that you shed on Calvary and that empty tomb that you walked out of. You are my risen Savior. You are my living Redeemer. And I'm glad to quote the third verse, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You know why you're saved today? Through the power and the preaching of the gospel. But what is the gospel? It is the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And how do we obtain the gospel? How do we see the picture? How did God have it in the blueprint? Through the shedding of blood. Christ, when he died, shed his blood. When he ascended into heaven, he took that very blood and put it on the throne and on the mercy seat, not of the tabernacle with man's hands, but the one in the glory world. And therefore God can hear the sinner's prayer because the blood of his son has been applied. I'm not going to heaven because of my religion. I'm going because I've been washed in the blood. I'm not going to heaven because I trusted the church. I'm going to heaven because I trusted the power of the gospel. And in this little diagram, you're gonna see a beautiful picture of the gospel and the shedding 
of blood. Now, I want to get in there to my left. See that room in there? That's where I want. A relationship with God, the peace of God, the presence of God, the pardon of God, the mercy of God, the glory of God. But common sense tells me if I want to get to that room in that left place and I'm out here, I've got to start right there. There is no way I can go there until I start right there. And what is right there? It is an altar where the sacrifice was slain and killed and the blood was shed. You can't go any farther unless you start right there with the death of the lamb or whatever animal they were offering and the shedding of his blood. Think about it like this. You can't go into there where the pardon is, where the glory is, where the majestic presence of God is without substitution without somebody innocent dying for the guilty. That's the track that I wanted. It is the innocent dying for the guilty. It is the Savior dying for the sinner. It is the righteous dying for the unrighteous. It is the holy dying for the unholy. Mm. It is the glorious God of heaven giving his son to die for sinful creatures like you and us. You say, what has that got to do with the Bible? Well, that's what the gospel declares. That's what the gospel says. What does the gospel say? Somebody died for you. And I know who that somebody is and his name is Jesus Christ. He that knew no sin became sin for us that we, even though we were in poverty, we might be made rich through the death of Christ upon the cross. You say, preacher, I sure would love to have a relationship with God and God have mercy upon me and God forgive me and God have his presence in my life. Well, there's one place you cannot bypass You cannot bypass Calvary. You cannot bypass the cross. You cannot bypass the place where the innocent died for the guilty. It's called propitiation. It's called substitution. It's called it should have been us, but thank God it was him so we could live. You say, I thought you said, preacher, the meaning of the word gospel is the good news. Well, how good do you want the news to be? Instead of dying without God, burning forever in a devil's hell, a man named Jesus who was perfect and godly and holy and just went to the cross, died for our sin, paid a debt he didn't know because we owed a debt we couldn't pay and didn't stay dead, but on the third day arose and he ever lives to make intercession. And now the good news is this, you don't have to die with that God and go to a devil's burning hell. You can get in the glory. You can get pardon. You can get in his presence. You can get forgiveness, but only by the way of the cross. That's what the gospel says. Somebody died in your place. Well, I'm trying to get in that room. I'm trying to get him there where the presence is and the glory is and the forgiveness is, but I gotta do something else. No, as you leave the place where the sacrifice was made and the blood was shed, you see that little dot right there? That represents the laver. That represents that bowl of water where the priest had to wash his hands and feet and face before he could go in the presence of the Lord. You say, what has that got to do with the gospel? Well, this is what the gospel says. Somebody died for your sins. 
but this is what the gospel does. He takes a dirty man and makes him a clean man. He takes a lost man and makes him a saved man. You know what the message of the gospel does? It provides a place where the dirty are made clean. Therefore, we're not gonna clean up this world through civic programs, social programs, Biden's paycheck, brotherhood, being accountable for your brother, a political revival, more social plans. No, 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 no. To clean up a dirty world, there's only one place to be clean, and that's through the power of the gospel. You say, preacher, what can wash the sin out of my life? What can wash the sin out of my conscience? What can wash the sin out of my mind? How can I be clean enough? How can I be pure enough to go from way out here on the outside to on the inside? How does a dirty, rotten sinner get in there to where God is, where the glory is, where the mercy is, where the pardon is, where the presence of God is. He must be cleaned. He must be sanctified. He must be purified. And ladies and gentlemen, can I remind you the only purification that's good enough to take you from the outside to the inside is the power, the cleansing power that comes through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Judas found out watching Pilate as he washed his hands of the Nazarene, but still went to hell. Millions of people today will go through all kinds of religious activity, but their lives are not clean. Their souls are not clean. They don't have a relationship with God. You know why? Because there's only one cleansing agent, and that is the power of the gospel. So much that we're gonna clean up society. We're gonna preach the gospel. I tell our politicians this, and they don't believe me. I got a plan that will change Clayton County. And you folks from Henry ain't too far behind us. And you folks in Pikes next in line. I've got a plan to fix Metro Atlanta. I got a plan to fix the state of Georgia. I got a plan that would blow Joe and Kamala out of the White House. I have got a plan that Congress and the Senate wouldn't know anything about. I've got this plan where the abortion clinics were closed and the hell holes are closed and instead of the college football game and the playoffs being packed and the church houses being half empty, have you noticed that? Have you noticed the world is back and sports is back and entertainment back and probably the last people to get back will be church people. Can I get an amen right there? But I've got a plan to fix that. I've got a plan to fix that. You say, what is that plan? You and I today get a touch of God upon our life and leave this building with the message of the gospel. Christ died for your sin. He conquered death for your eternity. And in future faith and trust in Jesus Christ, he removes sin. He cleanses sin. He purifies sin. He makes the dirty and he makes them clean through the message and the power of the gospel. You say, well, I believe if we had some more stimulus checks, we could get that. No, you're just gonna have more people not showing up for work. But brother Joe, if we had an accountability system where I'm accountable for you, you're accountable for me, we got one. And it's called Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit living in the hearts of his people. I, I tell our politicians this, if everybody in Clayton County would get saved, we wouldn't need a jailhouse. If everybody in America would get saved and get cleansed by the power of the gospel, you wouldn't need a jail, you wouldn't need a prison. Joanna would be out of a job. If everybody would get saved and trust Jesus Christ, you wouldn't need 911 except for the sick folk. 
You say, preacher, that's a utopia. That's what they're trying to get. Why they're telling us, well, if you don't arrest these people and if you don't put a bond on them and you don't make it hard, now they can kill three or four people and burn down two or three buildings, but if you don't be too hard on them, they'll get the message, oh no. That sin that's in them, that same sin that's in you cannot be tamed by legislation, sanitation, organization, religious or civil, but there is a power that will set them free. There is a program that will emancipate them from the chains of addiction. There is a power that will wash them whiter than snow. There is a power that will get them from the outside to the inside, and that's being pure and clean and sacred through the power of the gospel. Aren't you glad the Bible said that Christ with his blood has washed us from our sins. The only message that can purify a dirty sinner, that is the message and the power of the gospel. You say, Brother Joe, you act like the gospel is a cure-all. You mean I got that point across in just 20 minutes? That the gospel is a cure-all? Do you realize how much society, how much better off they would be if they would fund the church? Give us some of them resources instead of fight us in every turn and try to cripple us in every turn. And I want to say my grandchildren and your grandchildren are going to see a religious censorship that's not going to be even recognizable in the United States of America. And what bothers me is they want to stifle and muzzle and hinder the very power and the very plan that can change their community. You say Jonesburg's gone to pot. You let old-fashioned Holy Ghost revival in Harvest Baptist Tabernacle and you'll see a difference. You say, Lord God, brother, Metro Atlanta's going to pot. You let an old-fashioned revival break out and the gospel be preached and the gospel be received and people start getting saved and born again and changed by the power of God. I'm telling you, there's only one way for the dirty sinner to go from the outside to the inside. He must stop by the cross and accept the substitution and he must let the power of the gospel transform his life because that's what the gospel declares that's what the gospel says and that's what the gospel does I'm going to stop right there and pick it up later but I want you to show them this other diagram here now if you're going this way to the tabernacle and you're walking up to the tabernacle through the tribe of Judah First of all, you have to come to that brazen altar, right? Where the blood is shed. Then you got to go to that laver and be cleansed. Now, where is your goal? Where is your aim? Where do you really want to be? You want to be up there at that top one. The Ark of the Covenant. The mercy seat. The place where the blood is applied the place where the cloud of God resides. But I can't get to the top if I don't go by the way of the sacrifice. That's exactly how the tabernacle is laid out in its articles of furniture. Now, from a distance, going from that brazen altar where the sacrifice is made straight up to the mercy seat, and then you take that table of bread and draw a line to the lampstand. My God, use your imagination. If you draw a line from the altar where the sacrifice is made to the mercy seat where the glory of God resides and draw a straight line from the table of bread to the lampstand, Use your imagination. One more time. Draw a straight line from the altar to the mercy seat. 
and draw a straight line from the table of bread to the lampstand. Has anybody got it yet? Anybody got it yet? I'm gonna start taking interviews. Anybody got it yet? Raymond, if I take a straight line and draw it right up out of the top, right? And I'll take another straight line and draw it from there over to the left. Come here, Raymond. Hurry. Hurry. Come here. Tell this crowd what we got. If we take up from the altar straight to the mercy seat and from the table of bread straight to the lampstand, what we got? Well, I'm not the smartest, but it looks like a cross to me. Yeah! That's a cross. That's the cross. Now, now this is what I want to ask you. Who but a sovereign God? Two thousand years before the Romans invented killing people on a cross called the crucifixion. Who but a sovereign God could write in his book 2,000 years before the Romans came on the scene crucifying people that the only way to get into my glory and into my presence and into my mercy is by the way of the cross because the way of the cross leads home. Paul said the preaching of the cross to them that perish is foolishness but to us who are saved it is the power of God. Thank God for the cross. You can't go to the top where the glory is and the presence is and the blood is unless you start by the death of the sacrifice. You'll find what happens in closing this morning. I'll give you a little brief. He goes to that laver, he goes to that altar and sheds that blood. That's what the gospel declares. That's what it says. Somebody died for you. But then you go to that laver where you get clean. That's what the gospel does. It cleanses their dirty. But then he goes in that holy place and over there's the bread, the bread of life. That's what the gospel provides. It feeds the hungry sinner. On the other side is the lampstand. The only way to see, the only light in there was that light that flickered from the lampstand. That's what the gospel reveals, the glorious light of the gospel. But in that middle is an altar of incense where they will take a hot coal from this altar here and put it in that altar in the middle and they would sprinkle the spices upon it and it would evaporate and it would be a sweet smelling savior to the Lord and it represents the prayers and the praises of the saints. That's what the gospel gives. It gives you the right to pray and the access to pray and a reason to praise the Lord. But finally he goes behind the veil and he gets in God's presence and gets God's mercy and gets God's blood and gets God's glory and that's what the gospel accomplishes. The God in heaven dwelt on top of that people in the midst of that tabernacle and that's what the gospel does to you and I. It gives sinners like you and I the assurance and the power and the ability to declare I know God, I am forgiven. He has had mercy on me and he lives in my heart through the power and the preaching of the gospel. And you gotta start with the blood because without the blood there is no mercy and there is no forgiveness and there is no pardon. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. 
Listen to these two verses and we'll have prayer. Leviticus chapter number 16 and verse number 15. Then shall he kill the goat of the sin offering that is for the people and bring his blood within the veil and do with that blood as he did with the blood of the bullet and sprinkle it upon the mercy seat and before the mercy seat. And watch verse 16. And he shall make an atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel and because of their transgression in all their sins. And shall he do for the tabernacle of the congregation that remaineth among them in the midst of their uncleanliness. Somebody would say, why would God go through all of that in the Bible? Because they needed something for their sin. And why would God send the gospel? Why would God have a preacher preach the gospel? Why did God let you hear the gospel? Because there's only one cure for your sin. And that's through the shedding of blood, which is the power of the gospel. Let's stand together this morning. Heavenly Father, we love you today. And I want to thank you, Lord, and I, when I was a sinner, I heard the gospel. Thank you, Lord, that it was made clear and plain to my mind and my heart that I could not know you as my Savior apart from the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, help us to sing it in our song, preach it in our sermons, and most of us live it with our lives. Help us to be soul winners. Lord, we can clean this county, we can clean this city, we can clean this state. People will just be saved, but they can only be saved through the power of of the gospel. So help us to be faithful in giving it and living it. And we'll thank you, Lord, and we'll praise you because we ask it in the name above every name. Our heads are bowed today and our eyes are closed just for a moment. Greetings, everyone. This is Pastor Joe Arthur from right here at the Harvest Baptist Tabernacle in Jonesburg, Georgia. And I want to personally thank you for joining us today for our online service. I trust the singing, the preaching, the service was a blessing to your life. I trust that it birthed faith and hope and victory in your heart. And if you've tuned in today and you have any questions about your relationship with Jesus Christ, feel free to get in touch with us. We would love to help you come to know Christ and grow in the grace of God. If you're ever in the Atlanta area, I want to extend a personal invitation for you to come and join us. We're right off of Interstate 75 south of the city of Atlanta and the beautiful Lake Spivey community. And we would love to have you come and be with us on Sunday and enjoy the service. I would love an opportunity to meet you and your family. I trust you will pray for us here at Harvest. We have a very large mission program. We're involved in a lot of different mission projects. The Lord has been so gracious in opening so many doors, and we need your prayers for wisdom that God will help us follow the path that He has laid before us. If I'm ever preaching in your area, I'd love for you to come, and I'd love to greet you and let us know that you're watching our program. Again, thanks for coming by and join us again for our next scheduled program, and we'll see what God will do in our lives.